There we go. All right. Is that better? Okay, you can hear me. Anyone here for the first time? Okay, we have a couple here. Now, because I'm not the pastor of the church, I'm going to, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to have you introduce yourself. Would you mind doing that? Would you mind standing? And then tell us where you're from, why you're in Taiwan, and how long you're going to be here. Okay, Matt and Debbie, and the family name? Schleyball. You want to spell that for us? Okay. <laughs> I'm assuming that's German. Okay, we got it. All right. Germany didn't do so well this past week, so we'll, uh, we won't uh, hold that against you. All right. <clears throat> um, and you're from, I assume you're from the States. Okay. Where, where in the States? North Carolina. North Carolina. Good play. All right. Any, how many North Carolinians do we have here? Four. Okay. All right. Well, we're glad to have you. Um, come back when Pastor Homer here is here. He's in Hong Kong today. He'll be back next week. So uh, we invite you to come back. And all of you, what's your job? Bless them That's right. Get to know them. Bless them. Uh, yeah. Encourage them, Tim. All right. Okay and uh, get to know them as best you can. Anyone else you're here, you've been here before, but your time is limited, you're leaving Taiwan in the next week, couple weeks or so, and you will not be here any longer. Anybody else? Anyone fall into that category? All right, okay. I am, um, this side is hard to see, this side is, we have one over here. Hey, all right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, I guess I, what, the way I would start this morning is a welcome to the summer. All right. Uh, the weather we had this this uh, past week was not typical summer weather in Taiwan. It was very nice, very beautiful. Temperatures relatively moderate. Actually, went over to Jason and Shelley's house for a little uh, barbecue steak or grilled steak. We didn't even have the air conditioning on at uh, 5 and 6 o'clock at night. But August is coming. Is that right? It will be radically different, uh, if not today, soon. So welcome to the summer in Taiwan. How many bachelors do we have here? You're a member of the bachelors club. Your wife has left you. <laughs> Just Nolan and I? OK, I've been, I, I, I had uh, <laughs> I had lunch with Nolan yesterday at, uh, at Chili's, and I told him on the way out, man, I am getting tired of going home to an empty house. And so Karen will be back this week. Praise the Lord for that. And so uh, any, uh, any um, bachelor, no, it's not a bachelorette, but it would be, uh, what would it be? Your husband is not here. Okay, anyway, summer is an interesting time in Taiwan, so we'll uh, do it. Um, Dave asked me, he's going to start a series on uh, the 119th Psalm. And so he asked me to speak from the 119th Psalm, which at first I, um, I thought I would take one of the Psalm, one of the sections, and I would develop it and, and, and speak on it, which I did. I picked one that I felt the Lord was leading me to do, and for about four or five days I went through it and tried to develop something. Um, as I went through it, and as I began to do research on the topic that is presented in, in Psalms 119, which is the Word of God, and the precepts and the concepts that God gave me, the volume of information that was out there, and the things that I read, uh, just were monstrous. I couldn't, I, it was very difficult to get a handle on it. I read some of the wildest stuff this past week. I heard everything from a black preacher preaching from Ezekiel 38, the head bone connected. I heard all the way to Gallup polls about what's going on in the way that modern culture and modern man views the Word of God. Uh, according to contemporary wisdom, polls, surveys, um, modern man is not very impressed 
with the book that we have with us this morning called the Bible. He just is not. Even in the United States, which is still pretty much the number one country for evangelical Christianity, even among groups of churches within the United States that would be considered Protestant, the number of people that adhere to that denominational teaching or creed that actually believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God has fallen drastically in the last 20 years. Uh, to, at this point in the United States, only about 29% of the people in the United States give any credence to the thought or the premise that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant word of God. That's down from an, about an 1850 survey when 96% of the people in the United States believe that it was. So with all of these things in mind, I began to look at the topic of God's word from a different perspective. And I realized that I, I, since I'm not the pastor of the church, I really don't know which way uh, Pastor Homer's going to go with this, all right? I'm sure he's going to come in next week, and he's going to go over the 22 Hebrew letters that make up the, the, the basis or the foundation of, of, uh, of uh, Psalms 119. And I'm sure he's going to go into the acrostic nature of the, each particular one and the, how it's written in the form of a sonnet and a poem and all of those things. And I'm going to leave that to him, okay? Because I think that that's probably where he wants to go. So um, what I did was after about Wednesday, trying to get a handle on, uh, start, I, I chose verse 105, which we'll look at in just a moment. I began to realize that uh, probably my place would be more uh, in line today with just to give you some basic information and make this a very devotional type of message to spur you on, to incite your desire to read the Word of God, and especially through Psalms 119. I began to see, you know, if you're here in the ministry, uh, individuals like myself and Tim and stuff, the Word of God and the study of the Word of God is almost second nature to you. You almost take it for granted. But as I, in, in a different way, began to get a handle on the topic of the Word of God, I began to see that this topic is the most pervasive topic in the Bible. It shows up in the very first ver couple verses of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and God said let there be light. And it goes all the way through. If you look at the Bible, this topic will go all the way through until it shows up in the very last chapter of the, of the Bible, Revelation 22, several times, when the Lord himself says, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those that keep the commandments of the Lord. So from page one to the very end, you are we as believers in Jesus Christ, we are forced to deal with the topic of what did God say? Is what God said applicable to us? Is it something that we can rely on? Is it trustworthy? Is it inspired? Is it something that we can believe in with all of our heart and trust it? And of course, the, the typical answer of any church or any pastor or any Bible-believing Christian is going to be yes to all of those things. And so what I did this week was I read through Psalms 119 over 20 times. I read it through three times this morning. Just started verse number one, and I read all the way through 176. Without any, I took a Bible that I had on my shelf that I used that had no markings in it. So I had no reference point for anything. I just said, okay, I'm going to read this. What, what's going on here? And I, I began to see some things. And what I did for you and what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to give you the gospel of Psalms 119 according to David Freeman, okay? 
things I gleaned this week from Psalms 119. The first thing that I began to realize as I went through this psalm was I began to realize that if you are going to be what is termed a Bible-believing Christian, if you're going to take the Bible as a point of reference in your life in order to accomplish something, in order to come to God, Okay, if you're going to believe that there has to come a time in your life where you have some type of connecting point with the Bible. Okay, does that make sense? Now, it can be in the form of an epiphany, of an eye-opening uh, event, or it can be in the form of reading it or hearing it and realizing, hey, this is talking about me. In other words, you're going to... You, and so what I thought I would do to start my message is I, I thought I'd give you the, the reference point in my life that drove me and led me to be where I am today, not only a Bible-believing, born-again child of God, but someone who stands it and has dedicated his entire life and surrendered his life to preaching it and making sure that people understand it. I was 12 years old. I was raised in the home of a pastor, a very dedicated pastor, and his wife, they have four children, I'm the oldest. My dad was a church planter, so from the time I was first born, my dad was what they call a church, he would start churches, pastor them for four, five, six years, move on and start another one. When I was 12 years old, I was living in Clearwater, Florida, which is the opposite side of the bay, of Tampa Bay, and my dad was in the middle of starting his fifth church. So, I had been raised in the environment from the time I first came home from the hospital, I was in church. The Bible stories were second nature to me. If I had been asked when I was 9 or 10 or 11, do I believe this? I would have said, yeah, sure. Absolutely. But in reality, I had no real connecting point to the scriptures. But does this make sense to you? In other words, I, I believe that there are probably even some people here this morning that you would mentally assent that this is God's word and you read it and you hear it and you listen to it preached every week, but there has never come a point in your life where you have made a connection to the Bible, to the words that are written there. It was, um, I, mean, I wanted to get the details of this straight, so this last night I called my father, who's now 85, and I said, Dad, this is how I remember this. Is this the way it happened? And he said, yep, you got it right. Uh, my dad started this church in 1960. I was nine years old. Moved from Detroit down to the Tampa Bay area. He just, no job, nothing. Four children started a church. My mom worked at a sign company. The church had grown. They would bought property. They had a, a, a small building about twice the size of this room here. And I was, uh, I was 12. President Kennedy had just been assassinated about two or three months earlier, so for a young boy in junior high, uh, my mind was beginning to shift from Little League Baseball and holding hands with the girls in church and having a candy bar at 7-Eleven to some more serious things in life. I asked my dad about the individual I'm going to tell you about, and he, he told me his name was Buddy Deal. He was 24 years old, and just after President Kennedy had been assassinated, in a neighborhood behind our church, my father doing door-to-door -door visitation work to build the church on a, on a uh, I think it was a Tuesday morning, he said, he knocked on the door, and Mr. Deal's wife answered the door, and he wouldn't go in, because in those days, you know, even now, he wouldn't go in. He just stood there in the doorway, and he led her to Christ. She was 22. Had a little baby, less than a year old, right at a year old. 
And he asked her, do you want to be baptized? And she said, well, I don't know if I can be baptized. I need to tell my husband. And I want you to tell my husband about Jesus, and I want you to come back tonight. So my dad told me this. He said, I went back that night and led Buddy Deal to the Lord. Okay? 24 years old. He worked for Florida Power. He was a lineman. He worked on the power lines. Four months later, in March of 1964, on a Tuesday morning, Buddy Deal was working on a power line, and the man at the box that controlled the power thought he saw the guy on the ground, the, the middleman, give him the okay to turn the power on, and he flipped the power on, and a thousand volts went through Buddy Deal, and he died. And I distinctly remember, for the first time in my life as a 12-year-old kid, after, as it began to unfold, when my parents told me on that Tuesday night, I, my mind said, but I just saw him Sunday. And for the first time in my life, I realized that age and death mattered. It didn't seem right to me, that a man of 24 with a small baby and a wife would, I didn't, it didn't seem fair that he would die. Well, they had the funeral, and this was just, uh, I sat um, about where Ken is sitting during this funeral in our church. And the, the casket was in front of my father, and there was a long aisle down there, and I was sitting over there. I was 12 years old. And Mrs. Deal, my dad told me that he remembers it because they didn't have the air conditioning on. It was in March. And I remember a big black car pulling up in front of the church, and she got out and walked in. And my first thought was, she's dressed like Mrs. Kennedy. She had on a black dress and a hat with a veil. And we're talking about, folks, we're talking about hundreds of Florida Power blue-collar guys in the auditorium. We're talking about his company from the MacDill Air Force Base, and he was in the military. We're talking about a church that was full and people on the outside. And when Mrs. Deal came in, she was weeping, and I remember she fainted. And someone had to pick her up. And she sat about where Brian is sitting. So I'm watching all this. This was the first time in my life that I had ever seen my father, who was a powerful preacher of the Word of God, visibly shaken. I saw him sitting there with his lip quivering. I wasn't crying. It didn't, didn't affect me that way. And I saw Mrs. Deal weeping, sitting in front of my father. And I thought, whoa, my dad, just he's shaken. He walked up to the pulpit, and he gathered him, he collected himself, and he spoke directly to Mrs. Deal. And he said these words. I asked him, Dad, did you say that? And he said, yeah, I did. I said, he said, he called her by her first name. And he said, I'm going to read from the scriptures now. And I'm going to talk to you about what God has to say. And, that's what, and immediately, that woman sat up, took her hat off with her veil, wiped her tears, and sat there in a calm, collected manner and listen to my father read from John 14. That was the first time in my life that I had seen the scriptures physically affect someone in a way that was beyond the story of a man in the belly of a fish or a man slaying a giant. Those kind of things didn't make any connection with me. And for the first time as a 12-year-old boy, I, the thought, I said, this is viable. <laughs> There's something to this. 
It had nothing to do with my father. It had nothing to do with the situation. It had nothing to do. It was merely the reading of the scriptures that affected this woman and brought her back to a sound mind where she could perceive what was happening. And as a 12-year-old boy, at that point in my life, God connected me with the power of the scriptures to not only change, but to move and stabilize the human heart. And from that point, I went on a strange journey that I've been on for many, many years. I've taken a long time to do that, but what I'd like you to do this morning is I'd kind of like you to think about yourself. What are you doing here? Well, what's the point? I mean, come on. <laughs> If you're here and you actually, in your heart, don't believe that this book is the inerrant written word of God that has the power that I've just described to you, you're wasting your time here. There isn't any, there, it's not necessary for you to come. But if there has been a point in your life somewhere where God, in his mercy, has inexplicably connected you to this book, then you need to hear what it has to say. The premise is this, God said something to human beings. Okay, what did he say? And if he really did say it, did he say it to everyone or just to the people at that time? Or is what he said, is he, has he said it even though it may be through a metaphor or through a story, is he saying it to you? Do these words literally impact your life? Do they have that power? I, you know, for me, I have to say a resounding yes. Because I not only have experienced it, I've seen it. Okay, what did God say? Um, I want us to go, because we get so confused about this sometimes, I want us to turn to Romans chapter 15 and verse number 4. Romans 15, 4. Then we will go back to Psalms 119. Okay? Everybody with me so far? Okay. Anybody lost? Uh, I see some are going... <laughs> Not quite sure what you're talking about. All right, well, let's just, let's go on just a little bit further. All right, what did God say? Now, we have the idea when we go to the Bible, we get this perception when we hear words like commandments, precepts, the law, these type of things. We get the perception, whether it's viable or not, we get the perception that God is a demanding God that expects certain things and has given us rules and regulations to follow to meet those demands. And, and in, in a general sense, that's true. But there is a great overriding principle that God has given to us about the Bible that we need to think about more often, and it's recorded for us in, Psalm, in Romans 15.4. All right, what is the purpose here? for us studying the Word of God, for us listening to Pastor Homer preach. I want to tell you something. The last three or four weeks listening to Dave, he's laid some heavy stuff on us. <laughs> and if you listen to Uva before that, you probably are going to enjoy a more devotional approach this morning because the, the Word of God has been given out in doses that have been heavy and have a lot of meat and can not only change your life, but the truth that's there is not something that you can just dismiss at Chili's an hour and a half from now. It has to stay with you, okay? So what is the point here? It says, Paul wrote to the Romans as he closed the book here in chapter 15. He's going to write one more chapter. He says, for whatsoever things were written beforehand were written for our learning. All right. Um, what version is this? Uh, all right, ESV? All right, so it's going to be pretty close. I'll read it from the King James here. You look at it there, and any differences, you try to, we'll try to 
put them there. It's written for our learning or for our instruction, it says there. All right? Great. I'm for that. Amen? We've got a lot of teachers in our congregation. We have some wonderful people, but I'm all for learning. I think it's necessary. However, it goes beyond that. What does it say? You learn that what through what? Through endurance. Or in the King James, it says patience. That through patience and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. The object and the purpose, the main design of the Word of God, is to fill the human heart with hope. Now, I, you know, sometimes we want preachers, we want people to respond. I, I would hope there'd be some response to that. <laughs> I can always count on Tim, all right? <laughs> all right, so the overriding purpose of the scriptures is not to confine you. Okay? That was the argument and the principle that Satan threw at Adam and Eve. And what he used to, to demonstrate to them was that God had not given them all of the information. He hadn't spoken the truth to them. And what he said was, you're confined. you got to stay in this garden. So the overriding principle of the Word of God is not for confinement or restriction. It is for freedom and liberation and hope. Hope that goes beyond ourselves. That's where the hope lies. Look, intrinsically, every single one of us knows how bad and evil we are in our hearts. Right? If that's the only hope you have, the word according to you, you're in trouble. If the only Bible you read every week is your Bible, what's in here, you have some very serious problems. But the love of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God very clearly demonstrates to us that the reason why God gave us his word is that as we ingest it and take it in and live by it, that it will produce a patience within us and a comfort that we cannot get from any other thing. I, Nolan, I used the example you gave me yesterday. I just I thought it was so wonderful. Nolan, we were talking, we were watching a motorcycle race. And... Um, he said, you know, what, 10 years ago, I grew up on a motorcycle when I was a kid, and I got on, and I bought a motorcycle. And, uh, but he actually came back around and said, you know, I just after a while, I just quit riding it, because it really, that wasn't really what was important. Amen. <laughs> and I'm not trying to single him out to embarrass him. It's just, it's just a point that this verse brings us to. That the only way that we can get the true comfort that we need, that this life is going to change and get better, not only here but in eternity, is through the scriptures. All right? Now, um, back to Psalms 119, just for a moment. Um, everybody with me so far? I'm going to let Dave clean this up, so I'm not going to see it. on. <laughs> All right. What, I'm, what I would like to you to get more than anything this morning is I just would like to see some people realize how precious the Bible is. Okay? And not only the fact that people have died for it and because of it and all that, but you know what? I just would like to create in your heart the attitude that you know what, I can have happened to me what happened to Mrs. Deal when she lost her husband. Listen, folks. Right, Jason? That can happen to you. But it can't happen to you if the only Bible you read is the Bible according to you. It won't happen. The Bible is for our comfort and our encouragement. 
Now in Psalms 19, I'm going to take the position that many scholars have taken. There's no evidence of the authorship here of this psalm. But I'm going to go along with C.H. Spurgeon and in just about every... <laughs> this is David. If David didn't write this, when I get to have, I will be shocked because it's just the style in which David was a man after God's own heart as a very young boy that was the overriding principle of his character and this, this is God's heart. Psalm 119. I read it 20, 25 times this way. This is the heart of God. This comes from David. David, I've written down several things here. First of all, David says two things about the Bible or the Word of God to him personally. He only says two. In Psalm 119, you could, you're, I'm going to let you look it up. He says, number one, the, the scriptures are my delight. They're my delight. Now, I, uh, I was challenged about five years ago with this word to uh, think about what it meant. Now, we always think, what does the word delight mean? Well, I, for many years, I was like most everybody else. I thought, what, what do I delight in? Well, I delight in Karen, and I delight in my sh daughter, Michelle, and my grandchildren, and all these things. Well, you know, I, I, I read a guy that said, you know what? Don't think of those things. Those things are natural. That's what you naturally do. Think of something in your life that outside of your family, outside of any type of human relationship that you just thoroughly like and enjoy. And your heart, it makes your heart light to do. And I thought, and, I thought, and you know what? I thought, you know what? I like to drink coffee. I'll give you, I paid Tim, he's doing really well, all right? <laughs> and I thought, and this may sound, this may sound so off the wall in a message, but I just love to get up at five o'clock in the morning, make a cup of coffee, no cream, no sugar, big tall thing, grind the beans right there, a man's cup of coffee, make an extra song, sit down in a chair that I have set aside with my Bible here, with my wife asleep, with the radio and the television off, and sit there. And I literally, I, I can't describe to you the joy and the pleasure I get in taking sips of that hot coffee and reading. That is a delight to me. And you know what? I've used that metaphor in, in people's lives. That is how I should, I view the Word of God. The feeling that I get, the chemicals that go th into my brain and give me the feeling of delight and happiness and euphoria when I drink that coffee is the same way that the Bible should affect me. And David said, the word, your words are my delight. And you know what? I hate David, but I am very confident that I'm speaking to people here this morning. You don't feel that way. It's not going to happen. He was a man that was a king. He was wealthy. He had wives. He had children. He had a kingdom. He had walked with God for years and years and years. He had slain a giant, killed a bear, killed a lion, done all these things. And he very emphatically says, Lord, your word is my delight. Now, if I can impress upon you anything, it's to develop the type of attitude to where you thoroughly. All right, everybody think. All right, all right, here's the homework assignment. What do you delight in? All right, you know what? <laughs> I've given you something that I is kind of foolish. It's not to me. I love it. All right, somebody else give me something you delight in. Anybody. We can be, we're going to be interactive here this morning. Proactive.
how it's called. Anyone? Your daughter? All right, but, not, but let's try to get away from like your daughter. It's just something you do. Not necessarily, you know, anything? Rock and roll? Rock and roll? <laughs> and then we're going, all right. What else? Yeah, that, okay, this. Uh, I have a son that loves to tinker with cars. If you want to get Garrett all excited and just watch him, just get him out there with a wrench in his hand or whatever. You might be on a motorcycle, whatever it was. A scooter ride in Taiwan, there you go. You, you get the point, okay? The second thing David said about this several times, about he said, Lord, your word, your precepts are my comfort my comfort. Wow. There isn't a human being that has ever lived that at some point hasn't needed comfort. Amen? Some on a regular basis. Some at only intervals in your life. But no matter when it comes, no matter when the time arises, no matter when there's difficulty, no matter when there's un uneasiness or whatever, I want to stand here and give you the testimony that the Word of God is comfort. You can't even get the kind of comfort you need from the fellowship of the brethren like you can from God's Word. Why? Because, as David said, when that comfort comes, he realizes that what was written, the precept or the principle, he applied it to him personally. Therefore, it was comfort. Now, um, in Psalms 119, I don't know if you can get this uh, uh, or not. There are five well-known verses that just about everybody knows from this psalm. Anybody guess what they are? 11, 89, 105, 130, and 160. All right? Who has a Bible out that would read for me verse number 11? It can be in any version, doesn't matter. Jason. Okay. King James Version is probably the most well known. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Pretty good admonition. Amen. All right, verse 89. Anyone have verse 89? Can you get 89 up there? Okay, and there it is up on the screen in the New King James Version. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. A uh, very, probably one of the, the second most famous verse in this psalm. Verse 105. Can you get 105 up there? Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. <laughs> uh, how we have quoted that, okay? And I don't know anyone that teaches young people that hasn't whipped that out two or three times. <laughs> okay? And actually, I can remember as a kid getting uh, verse 11 on regular doses. Okay? Thy word, you hide God's word in your heart, and you won't act like you're acting, you won't talk to your mother the way you're acting, and all that kind of stuff. All right? I was familiar with verse 11 growing up. All right? How about verse 130? Verse 130. The entrance of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Okay. I readily agree. <laughs> I wouldn't be up here if that wasn't the case, okay? I'm the simplest of the simple, all right? And then verse 160. Verse 160. Every of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. The big five, all right? The big five of Psalms 119. But when you, when you progress and you go beyond these things, you, there are 10 things that David said that he personally did with the word of God, with the principles of God, all right? I, I was going to give you um, here 
uh, there are the word of God in Psalm 119 is called eight things. I'll just give them to you very quickly so you'll have a reference point as to what David's saying. If you read the psalm, there will be eight designations for the word of God. They'll be called the law, the testimonies, the way, precepts, statutes, commandments, judgments, and ultimately the easiest, the word. All right? Those designations are given to the Word of God in Psalm 119. David, in his personal life, in relationship to those eight things, this is what he said he did, or how he lived, or how he viewed those eight things, okay? Number one, the number one thing David says in Psalm 119 about the Word of God is, he takes and uses the verb, I will, I meditate, all right, I meditate on. He uses every, he uses this word in relationship to every single designation for the word of God. Meditation, and Dave talked about this was it last week or the week before. Uh, meditating, what it really means, and the thought processes that it takes to meditate on your word, on the word. Many of us, and I, I fall into this category. Once I read the word, once I close it. If I don't do something, if I don't perform the act of meditation, it's gone. All right? So he meditates. He says also, I have made your word a delight. All right? A delight. He says, I have kept your word. This is where we get hung up. Okay? It's this idea of keeping the word. Okay? and miskeeping and not keeping and making a mistake and all of those things. All of those things aside, David repeatedly says in Psalm 119, I have kept your word. Okay? Uh, number four, he says, I seek. I seek after it. I sought it. Number five, he said, I perform it. I do it. How do you do the word of God? You obey it and you you perform the action that's required, okay? Be ye kind one to another. Whoops. <laughs> See, we think performing the Word of God is like going to church and reading the Bible and praying, but some of the commandments of the Word of God really hit in a very hard way in our hearts, like perform being kind okay david also said i remember i esteem i hope in i long for and i establish the word in my heart okay those things are all great admonitions for anybody here this morning all right i have you look them up later as you plow through psalm 119 but there's something else that david says that i want to just in a few moments, maybe leave with you as the central thought before I get to the key, what I think is the key of this verse. Nine times David says, I love the word. I love this word. Now, I, 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 I grappled with this, and I thought as I prepared this, how do you make someone love the word of God? You can't. It's not my word. I can't make you love the word of God. Tim Gillette will love the word of God when he goes to it, reads it, and God honors that word and demonstrates that word to him in his life in a viable way and proves it to him, Tim over and over and over again as that takes place, he will fall in love with the author of the book. You don't love the words, you love the author. Does that make sense? The Lord himself is the author of this word. And why did David love the word of God? Because he knew the author. On a hillside outside of Bethlehem as a young boy, that author gave him the strength 
to lead sheep, kill a bear, kill a lion, kill Goliath, all of those things. And in the deep recesses of his heart, David fell in love with the Lord. You know, it has been... I hate separation from my wife. But when I pick up the phone and I hear that distinctive voice on the other end that is Karen speaking to me, her husband, the love of her life, I love to hear those words because I love her. And it, the words that she speaks to me when I call her remind me of her love for me and my love for her. Does that make sense? When you read this book and you plow through the Bible and you read what's there, it should speak to you literally, as C.H. Spurgeon said, as the greatest love letter ever written. Because it is the words of an omnipotent, merciful, loving, kind, benevolent, tender-hearted God reaching out to bring you back to Him because He loves you. Many of you here this morning don't love the Word of God like David did because you don't love the Lord like you should. That's just the long and short of it. And David said nine times, I love your word. Maybe it's time to take inventory. Well, um, David also made requests of God. <laughs> and I think this is pretty good. Because sometimes we get all, we put all these things, we stack them all up and say, oh, I love the Lord. But David didn't stop there. David was, he, was, he said, okay. You know what David did? In Psalm 190, he says, okay. I've done this. You wrote this. I love you. I love your word. You said this. I performed it. I did it. Now you do this. And what does he say to God? He says to the Lord several times, don't forsake me. Pretty good request. Wouldn't you say? He also said, deal with me bountifully. Open my eyes. Remove from me what shouldn't be there. Make me understand, God. I'm reading your word. Make me understand it. He also says, teach me. Make me go the right way. Deal with me the right way. Let mercy come to me. Give me a sound heart. Quicken me. Make me alive. Order my steps. Plead my cause. Consider my trouble. Hear my cry. Seek me. Make your face to shine upon me. Look, whenever you read the word of God and keep, get deep into it, don't be afraid to address God this way. What do you want? You know, when, when the Lord was baptized, when he was leaving, when he left the baptism of John, it says two, two disciples of John followed him and he turned around after they were following him a certain distance and he turned around and said to him, what do you want? Great, that's great. And you know what? You, you know what the Bible literally says to you as you read it? The Lord, the Lord is saying, okay, what do you want? What, what do you want? What, what do you want? What, what's your desire? Don't be afraid to speak to God this way. Now, <clears throat> you'll get out early here. Just a minute, all right? What's the key to Psalm 119? This is the key according to me, okay? I think Spurgeon might disagree or, or Dr. So-and-so or whatever, but this is the key. After having read it 20 to 25 times in just a few short days, this is what I see. The, I see it as fourfold. Uh, can you put up verse uh, 68? Verse 68. All right, first aspect of a fourfold key. Talk, David speaking to the Lord, you are good, and you do good. Amen? 
that's pretty weak. <laughs> you ask him. Is, is the Lord good? Amen. Amen. You know, I hate to go back to this again, but I think as a 12-year-old boy sitting in that funeral, I realized when my father spoke to Mrs. Deal and she listened, I, I firmly grasped that Mrs. Deal, in the midst of grief and sorrow, thought God is good. Uh, Dave and I texted each other, and I texted him, and I said, how's your mom today? And he said, he texted me back and said, well, she's doing better. She's off the ventilator. And then I texted him just a one phrase and said, he is good. And Dave sent me back a text of one word, indeed. He is. You know why you can plow through this? You know why all of these things are written in Psalm 119? You know why David did what he did and wrote what he did? Because he believed and knew that God is good. He is good. Very good. And he does good. All right? The second facet of this key is verse number 96. Verse 96. I have seen the... Cons consummation of all perfection but your commandment is exceedingly what broad this is where people get hung up modern man just simply refuses to believe and if you buy into this humanistic teaching you will miss some of the greatest blessings modern education modern philosophy Modern commerce refuses to believe that God and God's word has the answer for every condition the human heart will meet. And we just simply believe that there are some things that we can handle by ourselves. But the Bible and David here emphasizes in a very great way and this is one of the keys it doesn't matter what you pass through it doesn't matter what you experience the word of god the principles of god has the answer period it's broad what do we do we make it narrow and confining just like Satan did in the Garden of Eden. The, four, the third concept is verse, uh, i got to put my glasses on, 168. 168 is the third aspect of this key to understanding Psalm 119. I've kept your precepts, your testimonies, for all my ways are before you. You know, Tim, you and I have been kind of dialoguing here. Okay, All right, here we go. I can pick on Ken, but I won't. You know what? I'm sitting here watching Tim. He's with me this morning. He's amening. I'm watching him contemplate what's being said. I'm watching the Lord speak to his heart. But ultimately, I don't know what's in his heart. He may be thinking, get, get over, Dave. Let's move on. I don't know that. I'm just basking in his appreciation of what I'm saying, all right? But let me tell you something. And this is where you've really got to come to grips with who you are as a human being. All of your ways are open before God Almighty. And his answer to every way that you have, every thought that you think, every sin that you commit, every path that you go down, is broad enough to, in the Word of God to take care of all of those things. Last one. The last aspect of this key is verse 176. 176. All right. I told you. I thought this was the key verse in the whole thing until I read the other three. I thought this was the most important verse in Psalm, 1, in Psalm 119. 
I have gone astray like a sheep. Now, who wrote that? A shepherd. <laughs> you think David knew anything about stray sheep? David likened himself to the lambs he was taking care of on the hills of Judea, outside of Bethlehem. He says, I have gone astray like a sheep. Seek your servant for I do not forget your commandments. Well, when he does that, he connects himself to a verse that we need to close with, and that would be Isaiah what? 53 and verse number 6. Can you get it up? All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to what? Let's all say it loudly, all right? We have all turned to his own way. So here's, here's, here's the premise behind Psalms 119. You're going to listen to somebody's word. Okay? Either God's word or your word. That's all there is. Right? The problem with so many of us in this generation is that we compartmentalize the Word of God and only bring it out during certain instances. And what we listen to most of the time is the words in our own. We listen to our own word. Right? Say amen. <laughs> That's what I'm telling you. I've been there. Listen, you don't have any choice. I, I, I got bad news for you. You're going to follow somebody's word. There's a Bible that you are, is going to dictate what happens in your life and how you live. And it's either going to be this word, God's word, or your own word, the gospel according to you. And David said... The chief characteristic of my life is I want to go astray. I want to listen to my own word. Lord, seek me out and bring me back to your word. Well, I've enjoyed speaking to you this morning. And I trust as Dave goes through this psalm that you'll get some really rich nuggets of truth but my, my, my main hope for you this morning is that you will become like David, the great psalmist king of Israel, a shepherd king, a soldier statesman, someone who has a young boy like David Freeman, fell in love with the Lord by what he saw God do. And I trust today that your heart will be filled with love for the author of this book, that you will cherish his word, that you'll read his word, and that you'll realize that the word of God is the most pervasive subject in this book. It permeates everything. It permeates everything. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. I tell you what we need to do. Um, I've heard that Dave's mother is doing well, doing better. She's 83. She had open heart surgery. And I understand she's off a respirator and doing well. Her name is Mary, Mary Homer. We need to pray for her. She's in Florida. Anyone else here, and I can't see everyone here, anyone else here, um, you, have a, you have a request that might fall under the category we've been speaking about this morning that where, where you need the Lord to intervene and give patience and comfort. There is something in your life that we, we could pray about. Anybody like that here this morning before we dismiss? Sometimes we don't pray for each other enough. Anyone? Request? I'm blocking the, the floodlight here so I can see. Anyone? It's your last chance. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the word that has been preserved for us through history, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you have not only demonstrated to us the principle of Romans 15.4, but that we can experience it on a daily basis. That the things that are written 
are written for our patience and our comfort that we have hope. We hope and believe in you. We hope and believe in the world that you have prepared for us. We trust you. Now, Lord, we pray that you will give us a heart of love as you did David as he wrote this psalm many, many years ago. May the words and the admonitions of this psalm and David's life be very real to us. For those that are here this morning, Lord, that have really never had a connecting point to the word of God, I pray that you will give it to them, that they might see that the word of God is viable and trustworthy and that you really do manifest yourself and your love to us through your word. We pray for Dave's mother this morning, Mary. She's 83. She's gone through a very difficult operation, and you have brought her through with good health. We praise you. We thank you. We thank you, Lord, for her testimony to us of someone who at a young age was willing to surrender their will and their word and their very life to you and how you have provided for her and how that through the many years of difficulty and the loss of a husband and many things that she experienced, she remained faithful to you to serve you and how you have been faithful to her. Bless her, we pray. We pray that you will put examples of your faithful sermons in our life that you would draw us to yourself. And in the words of the great psalmist David, we leave our prayer this morning. Forsake us not. Guide our path. Give us the light that can only come through the scriptures. In Christ's name and through his blood we pray. Amen. Um, offering is out here. Is that right? Is there one there? And there's one back there. All right. David also compares the Bible to gold and silver. 